spirit of guidance. Okay. So I know I keep sort of saying, um, be patient with the readings. It's going to get really clear in just a little bit. And at this point, I feel like I might have become the boy who cried wolf a few too many times. Um, and if you started to read the philosophy of illumination and you had to um, drag your way through that first unit of it, which sounds like being dropped in the middle of a class um, of uh, philosophy logic and uh, syllogisms, and you were like, when, when, when does it get good? When does it get uh, into all the illumination stuff? Then uh, may it be that today as we work our way through. Um, so I thought what I would do with your permission is um, to start us off by maybe highlighting some of the passages that are um, quite intriguing and I think they connect very much to some of the work that we're doing in, um, in this uh, alchemy course. And um, you know, regardless of if you've had a chance already to go through this material in, in detail um, or not, then, um, then hopefully this will be of some kind of assistance. Um, so let's begin with the very title of the book itself, the Hikmatul Ishraq. Um, and they've translated the work here as the philosophy of illumination. Um, and so what I might do is periodically, I might just put some of the terms um, in the chat. Um, and uh, that first term, hikmat, is uh, the word for wisdom, wisdom, um, and here it's being rendered as philosophy, which if it were in that original sense of the love of wisdom, uh, philosophia, that would be one thing. I think philosophy sometimes today has been so reduced to a kind of rationalistic concept uh, that perhaps it doesn't convey all of it. Uh, keep in mind that in the Sufi tradition, uh, sages are usually called hakim, and that's a word that is also used for um, healers. So this is a kind of wisdom tradition um, that is not only individual, but it also has an impact on people around you, people that you come in contact with. Um, some of the sages like, um, and the poets, Sufi poets like um, Sanai, for example, is almost always referred to as Hakim Sanai, the healing sage. Um, and what is interesting for Sohrawardi, and he mentions this at a couple of points in his writings, is that there is a Quranic passage that he talks about how two things have been revealed to the prophets. And, and uh, the verse there is, we reveal to you al-kitab wal-hikmah, the scripture and hikmah and wisdom. And the Sufis love this verse because it, it in a way, it, it makes a little distinction between the literal scripture um, and then the wisdom that comes with a lifetime of immersing oneself in it and all the lessons um, from one's own life experiences, you can have memorized the whole of the Quran or the Bible and not have wisdom. Uh, and then the goal for someone like Sohrawardi, of course, is to bring these two together. So I think that term, uh, hikmah, is we could think of it as something more like um, the, the, the healing wisdom of illumination. And that word illumination is the one that we've talked about, ishraq. That's why um, Sora Wardi himself is usually referred to as Sheikhul ishraq, the um, 
the, the guiding presence, the master of illumination. Um, and by now, I think hopefully the, the Korban readings will be familiar that um, illumination here is that sense of orientation towards the light, but not of just turning towards the east. Um, so, you know, this isn't um, a notion that somehow God and wisdom are coming from the east, rather than it being a horizontal orientation, it's a vertical one. So it's a model in which um, one is returning back to the source of light. Um, so one of the themes that sort of already introduces pretty early on uh, is he talks about how the philosophy of illumination is in many ways um, an elaboration of a, a deep dive into those passages in uh, the Quran and the teachings of the prophet that deal with the notion of nur, of light. And um, so in full disclosure, uh, I like these verses so much that my own daughter, who was just recently born, was named Aya Nur, the verse of light. Uh, so, um, so she's very much kind of with us. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've spent some time looking at verses like, um, and God is the light of the heavens and the earth. God is the light of the heavens and the earth. Um, and of course, we see echoes of this in other traditions, uh, Jesus having proclaimed, I am the truth and the light. Um, we think about a sort of universal notion of associating light and the sun with, with the divine. And then that same light is, of course, reflected through the moon, and it becomes a cool light. If the light of the sun can burn your eyes and it can give you life at the same time, the light of the moon is a light that you can meditate on, reflect on. And that itself becomes a theme that Sarawardi returns to towards the end of the book. So if you make it through all the boring logic stuff, which I will confess is not my own cup of tea either, He's trying to deal with the question that so much of Neoplatonic Greek philosophy has been dealing with, which is how is the oneness of God related to the manyness of creation? How is the oneness of God related to the manyness of creation? Um, and there have been multiple answers that have been given uh, to that question. So there is a straightforward theological answer that um, theologians in the Jewish and, and the Muslim tradition give, which is that God creates out of nothing, that there was nothingness, and then there's an abrupt break, and God says to things, kun fa yakun, be and they are. So it's basically the poof model of creation. God poofs existence out of complete nothingness. Um, and the Greek philosophers hate this. They're like, how can you poof something? Poof is so abrupt. There has to be continuity. So the model that they like is of um, a stream that is flowing. And there's no break in the stream. The stream never stops. Um, and models of this are repeated in a lot of Eastern architecture, where in some places you would go and you would see seven cascading pools of water, that the first one would fill up and it would overflow into the second, and that would fill up and overflow into the third. And the Neoplatonists love that notion of, of and they would call this fade or phase in Urdu Persian, which is emanation, that the creation emanates from God. Okay, a typical Greek model, which is there to some extent in Sorawardi, but he's going to modify it, as we'll see in just a second, is 
that the closer you are to the source of emanation, which is to say God, then things are more subtle, things are more sublime, they're more luminous. And the further down the stream you get, it becomes dirtier, more impure, more trapped in the realm of materiality and the body. And there is some of that notion in uh, Sora Wordy as well. He uses sometimes the language of denseness, that um, the bodies are, are dense, whereas the lights are, are subtle and, and luminous. But towards the end of the Hikmatul Ishraq, the healing wisdom of illumination, he actually says something really extraordinary. And I think this is important for us, which is to say, the Neoplatonists are right that there is no abrupt creation, that things emanate in the same way that when the rays of sun reach us, there is no break in sunlight, that the sunlight continues to flow. Um, he's very adamant about the fact that what he means by ray is um, that the ray of the sun at no point leaves the sun. It never detaches itself from the sun. It is a continuous flow. And what he says, which distinguishes him from both the theologians and the Neoplatonists is if you are living in one of these subsequent realms of existence, you are actually doubly blessed because you're receiving light twice or four times or eight times. And what he talks about there is, and we'll come to this, that once you are receiving light directly without any intermediaries from God, whom he calls, rather than calling God, God, he usually uses the term Nurul Anwar, the light of lights. So first, he says, every single being is receiving light directly from the light of lights. And then secondarily, you're also receiving light through the first emanation and the second emanation, which he comes to associate initially with the guiding light of the prophets, the spirit of guidance, we could call it. Um, and he associates that with sayings where um, the prophet is to have said, the very first thing that God created was my light. And in Sora sort of Wardy's take, one reason that creation, emanation, is not just a degradation, it's not just things going towards the direction of creation being dense, but actually abundantly luminous, is that we receive directly the light of God, and we receive it through the prophets and the sages, and additionally, through all of the um, heavenly spheres and the realm of creation. So he uses at one point the phrase uh, in ekas, which is reflection. So you're actually bathed in light. You are surrounded in light. And we are to do both. Directly going back to the source of light, which is God the light of lights, and to also see the reflections of light uh, through all these realms of creation, the stars and the cosmic realms and the earthly realms, and then to also go through the channels of the saints and the prophets. Um, so that's a, that's a really remarkable innovation that, that he introduces, which wasn't there in a lot of the Neoplatonic um, 
ideas kind of before. Um, a lot of times his model of illumination ends up being called um, Elme Huzuri, which is knowledge by presence. Knowledge by presence. And the way that he defines this is sometimes he calls it knowledge by presence, sometimes he calls it knowledge by sight, he uses the terms a little bit interchangeably. But what he means by knowledge by presence is to come face to face into an encounter with the object of one's seeking. Uh, he uses terms that we know from the salute class like muqabila to encounter and mushahida, a mutual reciprocal witnessing. Um, so he goes far away from this notion that knowing God, that returning to the lights of light, light of lights is just an intellectual gymnastic game. You come into a direct face-to-face -face encounter with God. And the terms that he uses for this are kash and zok. Um, so unveiling and direct tasting. Um, all the veils being lifted, kash and zok, um, which is the kind of intuitive knowledge intuitive knowledge. Um, so if it's helpful, what I might do is I might just take us through some of the passages, pointing out some of the themes that he is, is um, raising. And um, um, we, we're not going to torture each other by going through that whole uh, lengthy uh, section on the name and the named and all of that. But here's the interesting thing that he's doing. And the introduction actually um, gets to this. He refuses to get bogged down in what has been the received tradition of Aristotelian definitions, right? You'll see him that he's so confident in his own standing that he oftentimes says, that's what the peripatetics say, but I think they're wrong and the position is absurd. And sometimes he's also likely to say, well, that's what Avicenna says, Ibn Sina, but I think he's also wrong, right? So he's kind of trying to carve out this new place for himself. And um, there's this wonderful saying, and I'll just read the sentence for you. He who knows the thing doesn't need the definition. And if he doesn't know the thing, the definition will not teach him what it is, right? There's a um, very famous Sufi joke that I'm sure many of you have already heard about Mullah Nasruddin or Nasruddin Hoja, this comic wise fool sage. Um, and he's asked to give the Friday sermon and he's not prepared anything. So he gets up there and he doesn't know what he's gonna do. So he goes to the people and goes, who knows what I'm about to say in this sermon today? And people are sort of confused. And so no one says anything. And so he's like, well, if you don't know what I'm going to say, then you clearly are not prepared to receive anything I have to say. And he gets up and he leaves. And he's like, good, I got out of that one. And he comes back the next week. And he still hasn't prepared anything. And he's like, who knows what I'm about to say today? Now, the audience has prepared this week, so they all raised their hand. We know what you're going to say. And he's like, well, if you know what I'm going to say, then there's no point in me saying it and waste all of our time. So he gets up and he leaves again. And he comes back the third time. Many of these Sufi stories occur in threes. Um, he still hasn't prepared a sermon. And he's like, who knows what I'm about to say today? And the audience is fully prepared today. And so half of them raise their hand and half of them keep their hand lowered. And he's like, well, in that case, how about if the half of you that know what I'm going to say, tell the half of you that don't know what I'm going to say, and then I can just go home, right? Um, when you hear these kinds of stories, and when you hear Sohra Wardi's discussion that 
the ones who know don't need the definition. And the definition by itself will not lead you to know. That's a great artist recognizing the limitation of his or her tool. That's a masterful piano player telling you um, any good piano player can hit the keys. The thing that makes you great is the silence in between. And, and Soho Wardy plays with this a lot, but he's coming out of this context in which, in which there's been a lot of this kind of a discussion. Sometimes, and we're gonna jump forward now to the second section, I wanna give you at least two examples of how he takes classical definitions and reinterprets them in, the, in this brilliant way. So part two, which is Fil Anwar al on the section on the divine lights, starts with him making a distinction between these two terms, Ghani and Faqir. So Ghani, and these are both Quranic terms, they come up in scripture and they come up in the philosophical tradition. Ghani means rich and Faqir means poor. In India, in South Asia, in Pakistan, also in Morocco, Sufis are usually called the poor folk, um, not because they're always materially poor, although many of them are, but they are poor in the sense that Jesus says, blessed are the poor. Um, in the sense that, um, that Muhammad says, um, I don't take pride in anything, but if I were to take pride in anything, I would take pride in my poverty, right? And the Quran at one point says, God is rich, God is Ghani, and you are the poor ones. So Rewardi takes that term and he redefines it to say that fakir, poor, means dependent, and rich means independent. In other words, our being is dependent on God. We have no independent existence apart from God, from the light of lights. But God exists independent of us. There was a quote unquote time before we were and God was. There will be a time that God will be and we will not. Um, and of course, some Sufis like Ibn Atallah of North Africa say, and it is now as it shall be then. Even right now, when we think the seven of us are sitting having this conversation, um, there is only God. So this is the kind of redefinition that um, Soha Wardy gives of, of taking terms that have existed before and um, reimagining them in this Sufi Neoplatonic way. We're going to jump a little bit forward to um, page 91. Um, and he talks about a distinction between the light of lights, the light of lights, which is God, and what he calls um, Nurul Awwal, which is first light. And the first light is that first emanation to emerge from God. That first emanation, the first light, this is basically the logos. This is um, Jesus saying in the beginning was God and there was none with him. Um, and identifying, and, and then there's the logos that is with God, um, the word, the divine word, the firstborn of creation. And of course, Muhammad, 
not in the capacity of an earthly historical seventh century merchant of Arabia, but as the embodiment of the spirit of guidance that has been shining through all the prophets is also the Nur al-Awwal, the, the first light. So he's having to come to terms with this um, explanation of how does this eternal, absolutely independent light of lights come to relate to the manyness and the multiplicity of creation? And for him, that answer is through the firstborn of creation, um, the Nurul Awal, the first light, which is identified at times with the being of, of the prophets. Um, there's a there's a fascinating place where, and this is one of those questions that I would love to have um, Pirzia go into depth with, but he talks about in this creation model, there's neither union nor is there separation. Part of what he seems to be implying is well, you can only have union or separation if two things have an independent existence. But if we say that we are separated from God, or even to say that we're going to have a union with God, then that's going to be making us dependent poor creatures into something that has an independent existence from God. So how do we get from the light of light to us? The answer, as fake Hafez would say, the subject tonight is love. Real Hafez never said that, but fake Hafez said that. Um, he comes up with this brilliant notion where the emanation of the light of lights, which goes through the first light and then gets into the heavenly spheres, the aflok, is through love. So let's take a look at page 94, if you have your PDFs with you, um, Andy. And the subtitle that's given to it, keep in mind that Sohrawardi, very few um, pre-modern Sufis ever put subtitles in their books. Subtitles are a very modern idea. So this comes out of the commentary tradition, but the subtitle does, in this case, does come out of his own language. Um, showing that the movements, the harakat of the celestial realms are from this word irada. But this one is worth pausing to just unpack this a little bit. That word irada, which um, the philosophers who translated this book, may God bless them and sanctify them and reward them for getting through the Greek section um, and shine the light of lights also into their cold dead philosophical hearts. They translate this word irada as voluntary, voluntary. There is an element of will and willpower in irada, but there's also the idea of desire. So the words that we know to be a murid, to have a teacher who is your murad, Morid is someone who desires, and your morad, your teacher, is the one whose companionship is desired. It's the desirer and the desired one. And so rewardy means both of them, that the movement of the heavenly spheres is not willy-nilly, it is intentional, it's voluntary, and it's a desire to be closer to the light of lights. He goes on at the bottom of that page 
to talk about how um, the heavenly spheres and the celestial term, uh, spheres are protected, they're kept safe from perversion, corruption, lower passion, and anger. Because these emotions pull you down from the light of lights. So where are you trying to get to? To the maqsade nuri, to the um, origin and goal of light. So when you read like Morshid's prayer, where he says, I've come from a perfect source and I'm bound for a perfect goal. The light of the perfect being is kindled in my soul, right? That's the language of the illuminationist tradition. You come from a perfect source. You come from the light of light. You come from a luminous place and you are destined for maqsad nuri this luminous destination, this luminous goal. And the light of the perfect being, the light of the Nurul Anwar, the light of the Lord of Lights has to be kindled, has to be illuminated, has to be lit up in your heart. Given the prevalence that some of this kind of teaching seems to have, it's all but impossible to imagine that some of these teachings were not also a part of, of Morshid's upbringing. Um, so that language of desire, is this, is this helpful? Is this still okay? Yeah, I don't like, okay. Um, I got excited when we got into part two. I was like, bro, you're killing me. Like all this Greek logic stuff. This is why I dropped my philosophy classes and it just seems like word plays and things. And then we got into like the Lord of light and the desire for, I was like, yes, talk to me. Talk to me, Sheikh al Um, And um, all right. Um, so we then get to, um, from a language of desire to a language of love. And so this is that term uh, in Arabic, ishq, in Persian and Urdu, um, ishq. This is the one that I've sometimes translated as radical love. Sort of what he uses two terms for love. One of them is the more mild and gentle kind of love, hub or mahabba. And then there is ishq, which is like, love when it just exceeds all the bounds, uh, extreme love, love that cannot be contained. And this is the language that he uses about the illumination of the soul. So we're going to take a look at how he does this. On page 96, where he's talking about how we in the realm of multiplicity can get back to the light of lights how we can be illuminated by God. He talks about three things that have to happen. So towards the top of page 96, the light of light shines its light. And I'm not a fan of this language of it. I understand that they're trying to avoid the gendered language that we get in English of he or she. And I think all of us have seen the pain that comes to people from the centuries long usage of he. And sometimes you can make it better by balancing he and she. I'm not sure that it is the answer because it just seems like an inanimate object. Um, but when they're talking about it, they're talking about the light of light. They're talking about the divine, okay? So, um, the light of lights shines divine light upon the proximate light simply by the virtue of the suitability of the recipient. Uh, suitability is too philosophical. Let's say um, receptivity. 
let's let's say the willingness to be a container for the light of lights. And your radical love, your overflowing love towards the light of lights. And the non existence of any veils, any barriers. So, those are the three things that you need in order to get back to the light of light an encounter with the divine, a face to face encounter in which you become, my heart has become capable of every form, as Ibn Arya would say. Um, it's that capacity to receive, to be receptive to show that element of love, and then to remove the veils. And of course, the veils are in us. There are no external veils. It's all of our own um, tendencies. Um, this is sort of the crux of his discussion about um, the notion of witnessing God, beholding God. And little background, and I think Pierzia talked about this in the last session that we had. Um, there was a very rich discussion of optics in medieval Islamic civilization. Uh, I mean, these were people that were doing eye surgeries a thousand years ago, right? It's, it's pretty extraordinary. Um, we're not sure how successful, but they were doing eyes. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so there was a, and, and the notion of optics, so there's people called like Ibn Haytham who write books on optics. Um, they thought that there's a light that goes from your eye and it moves towards an object. And whatever the ray of light from your eye would hit, that's what you would be able to see. So Rewardi doesn't accept that. For him, Vision is only, it's something that comes from God. So in order to be seen by God, then what you need to do is to be present, to be receptive. To, so this is very much that kind of antipodal language that Pirzia uses um, and Pir Vilayat used before of the notion that we're not the ones who are seeing God, we're being seen by God. And our job is to remove these um, veils and barriers that, that we have. Um, so going on just a little bit further, um, this one is also, I think a really good example of how he's using language that is being defined differently. So for any of us that have had the opportunity to work with some of the divine names, um, one of the names that of course we have seen is the name Qahar, Qahar, which um, there are less helpful translations of it. And sometimes in all kinds of books and online places, people translate it as the dominant, the conquering, the subduing. But when Morshid uses language like all pervading, that pretty much how Sohrawardi is using the term Qahar, all pervading. And the way that he describes this language is there's a relationship between the lover and the beloved. And we'll talk about one interesting um, erotic imagery that, that he comes at the end of the, um, the book to. He says that God's response to us is to be all pervading. Uh, there is no escape from God because we're already bathed in the ocean of light. 
And our response towards God is through this ardent desire, this radical love, this returning back to a face-to-face -face encounter. Now, if you're translating the term qahar as God is the dominant, God is the dominating, the conquering, well, uh, I mean, who wants to be loved by someone who's just conquering you? If on the other hand, it's a erotic metaphor of you seeking the beloved and then the beloved responding by saying, not only have I been seeking you, I've actually been embracing you all along. I've been with you all along. And the way that um, Sohra Wardy talks about this is on page 97. So this is his um, notion that you can only perceive something if you have something of the higher luminous realm with you. Um, so in paragraph 147, the lower light cannot comprehend the higher light for the higher light dominates it, I would strike out dominate and say the higher light pervades it, it enfolds it. But the lower light, that's us by the way, uh, the lower light nevertheless beholds, beholds the higher. And the term that's using for the um, beholding is that term yushahedu. So think about the language that we'd be using like mushahida, right? Which we used in the stages of saluk and, and what have you. That's what he's talking about. God pervades us, enfolds us, we desire and contemplate, right? That's the two-part dance. The light of lights has a dominance, has a pervasive quality in relation to what is other than the divine. I'm replacing all the it's. Um, the divine does not himself herself have a passion for another. But God has a passion for God's own self because God's perfection is manifest to God. God is the most beautiful of all, the most perfect of all. And I mean, the Arabic is quite clear. God doesn't love anyone that is other. God loves God's own self. So this is the kind of uh, insight that we see in a lot of the Sufi tradition, where the knower, the known, and knowledge are one and the same, where, as um, Fakhreddin Arabi says, the lover, love, and the beloved are one and the same, and where Ibn Arabi says, where we say, Alhamdulillah, praise be to God, it's only God praising God's own self. Like, just get, you know, uh, you're not that important. <laughs> All you can do is just to purify your heart to be a mirror in which God contemplates and praises God's own self. Um, Ibn al Farid, the North African Sufi, says, Every time you bow down in prayer, it is God praying to herself. And that's what sort of word he here says. God loves God's own self. Um, so then we get to this um, dance of our job is to turn in desire and God's response is to, um, to offer this pervasiveness. Um, as he's working his way through the celestial realms into the terrestrial realms, 
into the effusion of light. Um, there's nothing lifeless in the ethereal world. This is on page 104. Uh, there's nothing lifeless in the ethereal world. Um, so this is kind of like when you hear Rumi say, um, the four elements appear dead in your eyes, but they're living in the sight of God. And for Sahrawardi, by the time you get into the realm of ether, everything is, is living. I'm just mindful of how long I've been talking and we should definitely have some time for, for question and, and answers um, and, and just discussion. Um, so let me end by um, some material around page 111. The closer you get to the end of the book, the further away you get from all the discussion of Greek logic and syllogisms and all of that, and the closer you get um, to a language of devotion and desire of vicar, um, of, of um, uh, chanting the divine names, of devotion and of prayer. So on, on 111, he's got some really beautiful light prayers. Um, so even though so much of the book is at the theoretical level, um, towards the end of the book, he starts to have some practical elements that he introduces. So the first half of 111 are beautiful um, prayers of light, uh, including, of course, that God is the light of the heavens and the earth from the Quran, um, that the throne is of my light, um, and, and then also moves to um, prayers of the prophets. Uh, ya nur and nur, O light of lights, um, you would be veiled without your creation, and no light would behold your light. O light of all lights, the people of the heavens are illuminated, illumined by your light, and the people of the earth are brightened by your light. Um, I ask you by the light of your countenance, by the light of your face. Um, it was very touching at one point to read that um, there's a wonderful pun that he plays on the name of our dear and beloved Pirzia. Um, so if you make the, um, if we make Zia plural, one of the names for it is, um, as what? And he talks about um, the celestial lights, the celestial zias uh, that are that are present. Um, and let me end with two quick little points. And these I hope are obvious, but maybe just it bears to be repeated. Um, at the very end of the book, he talks about the sevenfold path which is not his discussion of Buddhism, though he's one of the only classical Sufis that I know who actually names the Buddha as being one of the prophets and sages. Um, what he says, he says, God has given you seven paths to the Lord of lights. So what are those seven paths? Your five senses, imagination, and that spiritual faculty of the intellect. I think this is something really worth sitting with, of, of contemplating, of exploring, because the senses are not about something degraded. The senses are not about this filthy, dense prison of the body. The senses, if they're purified and liberated, each one of them opens up as a path towards God. 
and so he's very clear that um, of all the senses, the one that is the most luminous, the most sublime, is sight, seeing. Um, and so he spends a lot of time on, on that particular sense. And so the body, which at one point he interestingly enough calls the fortress. The fortress, right? So think about this. The fortress is not a prison. The fortress is a place where you find safety. It's a sanctuary. Um, that reminder of that beautiful poem of, of, of Rumi is one of my favorite one. Um, oh, you who have lost heart in the path of love, flee to me without delay. I am a fortress invincible. Um, so the body, far from being this dark and dense and um, ungodly prison that you just have to liberate yourself from, for sort of word, it can actually become um, a place where you're bathed in light and you have light reflecting to you from all these different sources, and it becomes a safe place in which you can return to the light of light. Um, and then the last little thing is, you know, we so often have this discussion, and of course, within the um, Inaiti uh, tradition, you know, we identify ourselves as a, as a universal Sufi order. And I'm sure that term means a lot of different things to different people. For Sohrawardi, his idea of universalism is not so much that um, the same truth is found identically everywhere. And that um, these are essentially exchangeable uh, models. No, the particularities of each tradition matters a lot. But he talks about how wisdom comes from God, hikmah, and he talks about a like a stream that divides. He says there's the channel that went through Africa, through Egypt, through Hermes, and there it enters the Greek philosophers, um, Pythagoras, um, Plato, who is for him the imam, re-emerges through some Sufis like Zulnun al-Misri, who is the ancestor of alchemy in this tradition. Um, and then the other branch is through the Persianate tradition, all the great Zoroastrian kings and saints, uh, Feridun and Kehosro, and then he traces it again through Hallaj and, and Bistami. And then he sees these two streams coming back and merging together. So to that extent, this is how his universalism is working. It's Egyptian, it's African, it's Hermetic, it's Greek, it's Persian. Um, and it's the water of life coming back together. Um, and not surprisingly, that's part of why you get to have Jewish illuminationists like Ibn Kamuna, who writes a commentary on the Hikmat al Ishraq, and Zoroastrian Ishraqis um, like Azar Kevan and others in, in India. Um, so I think it's a it's a maybe a richer model of of um, a robust universalism that doesn't deny the indigenous roots of each tradition, um, nor of course does it erase the particularity and roots of Sohrawardi himself. Well, this was great. Thank you very much. Have a great day. It's uh, three o'clock, time to go home. You can't ask any questions because I won't know the answer. And if I don't know, I just say, go ask Pirzia. <laughs> But maybe we could have just a couple of minutes if there's um, 
I'd love to just uh, open it up for a few minutes and see if, uh, sorry for my verbosity and enthusiasm about this material. Thank you so much. Sure. I apologize for my tardiness, um, but how, how's your baby and your wife? Well, uh, thank you so much for, for asking. Um, you know, the baby sleeps like a baby. She, um, she wakes up crying every two hours and, uh, you know, uh, but uh, here is a little picture of her. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. So she's very, she's very cute. Yes. Um, uh, don't let the cuteness fool you. Like, uh, like all beautiful beloveds, she demands and receives full surrender. Uh, so we, we bow down at, at her altar and, uh, uh, no, she's, uh, she's very sweet. And, um, um, uh, thank you for keeping her in your, uh, in your prayers. Eileen. Thank you. She looks very alert. She so. is, she is. We're, you know, I've, I've had children <laughs> and I'm, I'm used to children who just kind of sleep for most of the day, but, uh, you know, um, she, this this is an awake child. This is uh, she she is uh, very alert, um, very engaged, and um, uh, I, I really do appreciate everyone's uh, understanding and letting us take a little break so that uh, Sakina and I could um, brace ourselves and prepare for this angelic source that's coming from the light of lights. Mm. I'd just like to say thank you so much for that um, exposition because uh, I must say I find the, the work, the text very difficult. So that this really, I think, helped me no end. So thank you so much for taking the time with us. May it be, may it be helpful, may it be helpful. I, I confess I'm in the same boat. We're in the, not only in the same ocean, we're in the <laughs> same boat together. Um, and there were many, many of the passages that I was like, I don't, I don't know what he's talking about at all. Um, and, and so much of it is like a very medieval discussion, like the whole discussion of motion, right? Um, uh, I mean, this was a Harikata Johariya, the motion of essences and things like that. I mean, these are part of very technical uh, medieval discussions that don't resonate as much for us, but but then there's the material that does. Um, and I kept coming back to so many of the um, prayers of Morshed and some of the languages that we have heard. Um, and in the same way that he talks about the light of light being reflected in the first light and in subsequent light, I, I see the, the, the light of Sohrawardi being reflected and carried on. Uh, in the in in the teachings of Morshid. For me, it was the absence of oh. paragraphs that drove me crazy. <laughs> I need um, Aline knows as a writer, I really believe in paragraphs, and when I see text which goes down two pages, it bewilders me. So it was so good to have you go through it, digest mm -hmm. it for us, and then give us the uh, point we need to know. I really yeah, and, and you know, I have to say, like, um, I don't pretend that a reading uh, philosophical, mystical Arabic texts is uh, what I do every day of the week. There are times where um, the Arabic really is so much more clear. Um, and, um, and I think the authors were also trying to have the printing of each Arabic page and the printing of the translation on the same page. And so sometimes you see like large chunks of white space on the page. And sometimes you feel like they've had to shrink as much text onto the English side as possible because the Arabic texts are a little more, uh, dense is not the word, but concentrated. Um, yeah. 
Well, I, I, I too, Omid, uh, greatly appreciate your going through this for us. I made several earnest attempts to try and get through it. Um, but I do feel that there is a lot of similarity now to Corbin's book, and of course, to the work that we've been doing in alchemy. And um, I look forward to going back to the specific pages and, and areas that you highlighted to delve in a little bit more deeply and, and um, perhaps I'll even try to unearth a little bit more myself. So thank you so oh, much. My, my, my pleasure. You know, I think in terms of the connection to the alchemy readings, um, one place that I myself wanna go back to is there's a five page section from about 125 until about 130, 135. Um, and that's where he's talking about the four elements that of course, you know, we all know. And he mm -hmm. talks about this notion of transformation, of how the elements transform into one another. Um, mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, the word that he uses for it is inqalab, uh, which nowadays just means revolution, right? But it's like, think of dust revolutionizing, transforming to water, to fire, to air, and then all of them being subsumed in, in ether. Um, and then he also goes on and talks about the ruh, the, the spirit, um, and how the spirit isn't just in one latifa. The spirit is actually through your whole body. Um, and I think some of those kinds of themes are really helpful for the alchemy material. So I hope, inshallah, we can all kind of keep an eye on them. Uh, yes. OK. Well, um, so wishing everybody a beautiful day. Um, yes, thank you so much. I'm happy I just got a little and, and apologized to be late, but I couldn't enter. And then I gave up and then I tried and yeah, my Sunday, my Saturday evening is rescued now. <laughs> um, if, if I had a few more cups of coffee, I would come up with a really cool illumination joke about how the rescuing is only by the light entering to where you, but it's, it's uh, I would need some more caffeine for that. So wishing you, everyone, all of us, all the best. Um, uh, Ramadan Mubarak for the friends who are uh, able to fast and uh, looking forward to all of us being together with Pirzia in just a few weeks from now. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.